California edition election day just around the corner and we're here with Jerome Horton. He is the chairman of the Board of Equalization in the state of California and I want to speak with you sir about some of the propositions on the ballot and I want to sure. start with Proposition 30. That is a governor's tax initiative. Mm -hmm. It would increase sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, increase income taxes on the wealthy for seven years. Have you taken a position on Prop 30? You know, Brad, I, I haven't. I'm very supportive of Prop 30 because Prop 38 has some challenges that concern me, significantly so, concern me. Well, let's talk about Prop 38 yeah. because that is the competing initiative. Yes. And as we speak today, I have seen several advertisements by the pro Prop 38 folks coming against Prop 30. That initiative would raise income tax on everyone 0.4% to 2.2% on a sliding scale for, I think, almost a decade, if not more. And you're not alone in your concern yes. about Prop 38. I'm not taking a position, but I know right. a lot of elected officials have come out very concerned about Prop 38. Well, the concern about Prop 38, Brad, is that the taxes individuals are making $7,000 dollars at a 0.4 percent rate and right. it's sort of a gradual rate increase as you go up to a million and beyond the challenge there is you're basically taxing the homeless mm. i mean those are individuals that are below the poverty line they're not making money at this particular time and it's a real challenge those are the individuals we ought to be lifting up and encouraging them through could, education could one argue though it's more fair if you're going to tax tax everyone well, I mean, when you talk about fairness and justice and so forth, those of us who are who have privilege right. as a result of being a part of this society of freedom, well, we're required to, to contribute more. And I think there's a lot of fairness and equity in that. If we begin to build up the, the middle class, and particularly the poor in this case, uh, we have a responsibility to do so. And I, I understand where you're coming from. I also understand, though, that if you look at the November ballot, you have Prop 38, which deals with taxes. Mm -hmm. You have Prop 30, which deals with taxes. Right. You have, in Los Angeles County, a quarter of the state, you have an initiative to extend a transportation tax for another 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's a sales tax. You have the Amazon tax, which just kicked yeah. in. Yeah. You have the fire tax. You have the lumber tax. Tax, I mean, tax, tax, tax. Yeah, there's tax, a lot of taxes tax. before us yeah. right now. And <laughs> while know. Californians, we want to be generous, right. we want to be able to support our social services and education. Tax, yeah, tax, I, tax. You know, Brad, I think they all go down, to be honest with you, because really? of that. I, you know, people are very frustrated these days. And so the initiative process is not the appropriate process to modify the tax code. We really need to look at it intelligently because let's take the uh, Proposition 30 and 38. Let's say, for example, the income tax goes up. Well, it's not the tax rate. It's the loopholes. Because mm -hmm. if the taxes go up, we simply contribute or, or spend more money on the loopholes. You create another shelter but, but and so he, forth, and you still pay the same low amount of taxes. But here's the challenge. The challenge is that in California, while we passed an initiative two years ago right. to allow a majority of the legislature to vote on a budget, we still need two-thirds to pass taxes, to pass tax increases. And for better or for worse, the Republican Party yeah. and its members have refused to vote for any tax increases. Well, we, and so we, where, do we, come? where we, do we go? We recently sought to fix the problem to allow a majority to pass a tax initiative, to do, deal with the budget issue. But that's the budget issue. They left issue. the budget out. I mean, they left the, the budget issue out uh -huh. and said it still requires a two-thirds vote. Right. I mean, we, we have to fix that problem. I mean, when you incrementally begin to address a problem, you're going to open up Pandora's box in other areas. So do you see that happening, though? I mean, you know, Californians may be blue when it comes to social issues, right. but they're very reticent. I mean, yeah, look, we are. sir, in June, we had an initiative on the ballot to increase uh, ta tax on cigarettes. Mm -hmm. We're not in Kentucky. We're not yeah. in North Carolina. Yeah, it's California. It failed. It failed. Yeah. By a squeaker. Yeah. And it yeah. failed. Yeah. So, well, I think part of the reason some of these initiatives are failing is they have that look some somewhere in the initiative there's a little ca caveat that has a challenge. Prop 30, for example, which I'm I'm supportive of, uh -huh. compared to Prop 38, is the I best understand. thing out there. However, you know, it's got a provision in it that makes it retroactive. Prop 30. Prop 30 makes it retroactive. Uh -huh. So uh, 
it, it, it goes back to the first of the year. Uh -huh. If it passes, oh, I understand what we you're will saying. owe on taxes tax. back to the first right. of the year on the income taxes. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, the other challenge is, is that it does go into the, into the general fund. Right. Now, now I happen to be supportive of that. But, but some argue I think it's great. That's a I plus. think that's the way it should be. Because Prop 38 is a lockbox for a education. Lock box. Right. I think it should go in the general fund. I mean, I believe in the democracy, and I believe we ought to allow the elected representatives to be able to make those decisions as we go through the process. But um, the challenge uh, is, you know, we're not exactly telling uh, the people the truth. I, I want to yeah. shift gears slightly. It may be quite a shift, but I sure. think it is relevant. And talk about medical marijuana. Oh, uh, if you want to balance the budget, balance, use medical marijuana. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not supportive of marijuana being smoked or used by children and so forth and so on, but it's passed. It's the law. We need to implement a tax structure. Brad, currently there's $24 billion in sales of, of marijuana here in California, both legal and illegal marijuana. California is one of the largest exporters of marijuana throughout the world. So currently, if you walk into a medical marijuana clinic, is it considered a drug and therefore not subject to sales tax? No, it's considered tangible personal property and therefore subject to tax, sales tax because it doesn't qualify for the medical exemption. So are you seeing medical marijuana clinics collect the sales tax and remitting those to the Board of Equalization? They're remitting somewhere around $58 million, but keep in mind, we're talking about a $24 billion industry. So it should be $2.4 billion, or uh, $2 billion, if you $2 think billion about it. Yeah. $2 billion. If you think about sales tax. Right. So I know that you're hiring folks, for example, with regard to the Amazon tax. We are. We so are. what about hiring s some folks to um, go after the medical marijuana clinics? Well, collect their sales you tax. Know, it's not the clinics, Brad. It's the individuals that are growing. You have to establish a structure that licenses the individuals so we can control it there. But license the distributors and the retailers and so forth. But it's the retailers that are collecting the sales tax, no? Yeah, but it's the distributors that are distributing it. Mm -hmm. And so if you control it at the distribution level, you can control it at the retail level. So you put a, similar, similar to what we did with the, uh, with the excise tax on diesel fuel, when we had the organized crime was going in and selling diesel fuel, we taxed it at the refineries. Well, that's interesting. And that controlled it. So all the marijuana that's grown in California, we put, basically put a, a virtual tag on it. And then we begin to track it through the process. So would there also be a sales tax? There would be a prepaid sales tax Pro on ah. that. Ah. So you pay it in advance. So we're not raising taxes. You're not raising per taxes off per yeah. se. Uh -huh. You're raising revenue by controlling and making sure. I mean, take Las Vegas, for example. Oh, yeah. I mean, illegal killings, murders, and so forth and so on. They made it legal. They controlled it. They squeezed out all the criminals. Are you talking about prostitution? And all the illegal We're talking activity. about No, no, I'm talking gambling. about gambling. I understand. Prostitution is a whole other story. Right, okay. <laughs> but there is some legal prostitution. In, well, it's coming up, yeah. you know. That's another conversation. <laughs> I want to ask you about Prop 32. Yes. Um, on its face, one could argue it seems like a net positive. No contributions from corporations, no contributions from unions. But virtually every editorial board I have read um, has said that it's just – it's not what it presents it to be. The book, you know, don't judge the book by its cover. Yeah, they basically lied, Brad. Prop 32, um, it, it, it's putting on the images as though it's controlling, it's reform as far as election financing and so forth. The reality is the Supreme Court has said, listen, contributions can, can be funneled into campaigns a number of different ways, so it's not going to stop that process. It's not equitable. Prop 32 is not equitable. Uh, it, 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 it tells individual workers who organize, who come together in order to protect themselves, that they can't do that. Yeah, I mean, it, what, as I understand it, it's, it prevents a checkoff for union contributions, and it's supposed to prevent uh, cor corporations from contributing, but I guess from the, what I read from the editorial boards, right. the loopholes for corporations are quite large. The loophole is like a Mack truck. You know, it is extremely large, could drive through the loopholes. And then, you know, you got the Supreme Court issue that allows corporations. Right. Citizens United. Citizens United. So you have a situation where independent expenditures today in these campaigns are spending hundreds of millions of dollars in the campaigns. And there's no control of it at all. And so Prop 32 is bad. It needs to go down. We need to be smart about it. I mean, there, there has to be some campaign I wonder reform. if it passes, if it's even constitutional. I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court has been very clear. Right. on how money is speech and First Amendment rights. Are, First Amendment rights. Right. Okay. His name is Jerome Horton. He is a member of the Board of Equalization. He's actually chair of the Board of Equalization. Don't forget, Election Day coming up November 6th. Yes. My name is Brad <laughs> Pomerantz. We'll be right back on California Edition. <laughs>
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. It's our guest today, Don Kanabi. He is a member of the Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles County. And in Los Angeles County, there is a measure on the ballot. It's known as Measure J. And what it does is it extends the transportation sales tax that was passed by Measure R in 2008 by an additional 30 years. Right. So it's 30 plus 30. 60 year tax. Just keep on taxing. Keep on. It doesn't increase the tax, it extends it. It extends it. Um, I you know, my, my point being is I think it's disingenuous to the voters to do this this quickly. If this was year 25 of a 30-year deal, 30-year commitment, I mean, the whole point that Major R just barely passed was the fact that it was going to go for 30 years right. versus the others that have gone on forever. But as I understand it, what the proponents are saying is if it does pass and you have a 60-year flow of funds that you can bond against that more easily. Is that true in your mind? Well, the reason they went to that, to, to an attempt to bond more easily, is the point was, was we were told that if we pass Measure R, then we can go to the federal government and expedite we call it the 30, 30 temporary, 10. which I supported. Right. Okay. And in the 30-year, the Measure R program, it's a very disciplined program with project. But even with the 60 years and this bonding that they're talking about, there's not enough money in there to complete the project. But My point being, finish what you start. But we didn't get 3010. That did not go through because, you know, we're right. So we still could have attempted or? to bond the 30 years. On have our own. we t talk to me? Have we bonded against the 30 years? No, we haven't. We haven't tried that. We thought the easier way would be to go to 60 because it gives you more years to collapse the bond. The problem being is inside that. In the original measure R, it took a two-thirds vote to move dollars to another project. The plans had were in the legislation were very specific. Two-thirds vote. Right. Okay, and you can only do it once every 10 years. Right. Okay, in Measure J, they changed the legislation in the last two days of the legislative session from two-thirds to a simple majority. Now, is this was this put on by the state or by the county? This was put on by the MTA board. Continue. But you had to have the state approval to raise the sales tax. The point being, now that money, that pot of money, can be moved by a simple majority of the MTA board. All of a sudden, you've lost every bit of discipline that you had for a 30-year plan. Try and finish what we started, okay? And in year 25 or year 24, if we need more money, we can see we've completed. Tell the taxpayers, look it, we've done this, this, and this with your money. But to go back in the first four years of a 30-year pack with the voters is absolutely disingenuous. It's interesting as well that it was decided to put Measure J on the ballot at the same time that the voters are considering Prop 30, which is the state ballot initiative. And Prop 38. And, and Prop 38 as well, but Prop 30 increases sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, even though Measure J doesn't increase sales tax. You know, look, it, it's a lot of taxes before the voters. How can you say, you know, and some of the proponents say, well, you know, you can collapse your bond, but if you don't have enough money to finish everything else that's on there to begin with, there's no, there, there's no expedition, no expedited manner to finish the green line into the airport. That, but that could hasn't... there be if you have the additional 30 years and then you can bond? No, because the projects have to be specific. And that's the point. By the extending the measure, measure J extends it 30 years. All it does is pick other projects. This is a raid on money to finish the subway to the sea. Is that no, bad? To finish the subway to the sea? Absolutely. This is, look at 88 cities, 10 million residents vote on this. This is not a city of LA ballot measure. No, it's county. Okay, it's a countywide measure. And yet, most, majority of the funds are being gone to the subway to the sea, which is not a bad project on its own, but it's not the only one. If you want a regional transportation system, we have to talk about the 710. We have to talk about 7, the 710. Those are fighting Six. words. Those well, th three numbers are fighting words. They are. But but, but let's talk about the subway. We got to the two sea. ports. We got the airport. Right. But it's interesting because if you look at the subway system as it's built out today, it does feel as if that it's you know the San Gabriel Valley to Long Beach. We haven't seen a lot on the West Side. What you know, and I use that term very broadly. I mean, we do have the Expo Line coming a bit. You know, you've been, you the run know. on the money has been always been on the west side. And I have nothing against the west side. I always tell people though, there is life beyond the east side of the 405 freeway. In other words, the raise of money. Look, we're doing a, a I-5 widening that matches up to Orange County now, right? Because 20 over the last 20 years, it's been a west side run on dollars. My point being is, you have to be equitable about the way you set up these projects. This is not willy nilly. These projects are set up by legislation. So the point being is that 
to finish it out to the east side, out to the other counties, to finish it down through the southeast area, to finish it down south but in the south central. Are you, are you concerned that if Measure J passes that the west side will take a disproportionate amount of dollars? Does somehow Measure J do that? No. I'm concerned that that will happen. Right, that's what I'm asking. By the fact that they change the legislation from a two-thirds vote. That I understand. Okay. Then you lose the discipline to I a understand. simple majority. Okay. Okay? okay. Because that's the most expensive project. But we need the regional connector. Uh, the probably the most important piece of all this, which is the piece downtown, which means from Long Beach you can go all the way up, you can go all the way out, you can go all the way east. You don't have to get off a train. I want so I mean, those are kinds of projects that are hidden. The people are so important. We need to finish. I mean, the Secretary of Transportation has told Supervisor Willie Thomas and I, I said, when are you guys going to finish it into the airport? Right. You're the only world-class area that doesn't have a, you know, a rail connection. Well, they traded, years ago, they traded the last leg of the Green Line into the airport for the first leg of the Red Line, the subway. So once again, we're up against subways. And there's nothing wrong with subways, okay? But it's a very, very expensive proposition. And you don't just say, well, let's just tax another 30 years, even though we don't have enough money, just the tax to be taxed. Has taxing. the Board of Supervisors taken a position? Yes. And that position is? Uh, we did not support. I mean, in other words, there are two people to support, one abstention, and two opposed. So, so there's, it's there's a neutral. No Interesting. Right. I want to shift gears, if we may, sir, and talk about something we've discussed in the past, and you have been very, very passionate about it, and that is trying to eliminate the scourge of human trafficking. Um, there is a proposition on the ballot, we haven't heard a lot about it, Prop 35, which would increase penalties for human trafficking. But could you briefly talk about the scope of the problem, and then we can talk more about 35? Well, I think you and I have had a, a brief discussion sort of right. off the air about this. The fact is, when it was first brought to my, our, my attention by our probation department, two gals that are absolutely angels and my heroes, mm -hmm. uh, that the problem was right here in our backyard. I always thought of human trafficking as something in a third world country. Of course. Okay, but it's right here in Los Angeles County. It crosses the border into Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange County, San Diego County. And when we talk about trafficking, we're not talking Look, all trafficking is, is horrible, but you've told me stories about the trafficking of young girls. I'm talking, Absolutely. you know, not... The youngest I've heard of is 10, all the way up 14, 15 years old. And what's been happening is they're, they, they're the ones that are getting arrested, and then they, you know, slap on the hands, and the pimp's waiting for them in the parking lot, in the courthouse, and they go back out, and they, they're getting, you know, burned in with, you know, all kinds of things just to identify their pimp. And it's just a horrible situation. You know, someone like myself that has a granddaughter's... Right. Uh, you know, it's just horrific to think of it. Uh, a story, I was helping with a fundraiser for this particular project, and one of the probation people got a, a, a text right there, and she asked me to come over and look at it. It was a 10-year-old girl had just been arrested. For prostitution. For prostitution. <sighs> I have a 10-year-old. And, and the, the point being is that we've tried to do is circle them with services. So we've isolated a courtroom so that these young ladies can go in there. You've got the DA, you've got public defender, you've got the judge. You've got the sheriff's department, probation, everybody, so that mental health services, health services, housing, so we can take them out and try to break the cycle. And as I understand it, under Prop 35, part of the fines that would uh, be collected would go to services for victims right. and toward law enforcement. The, the fines could be up to $1.5 million. Uh, this is a very lucrative business. Gangs are getting into the business, and I'll tell you why. You know, when you, when you sell a drug, you sell it one time, uh, mm -hmm. uh, one night. Uh, when you sell these young ladies, you can turn them four or five, six times a night. So it's a very lucrative business. So you can, it, what it does, it, it, it increases the penalty from 15 years to life. It fines up to $1.5 million. I, I, the funds going into services for these young I, ladies. I must ask you, as deplorable as these people are, we do know our prisons are overcrowded. Is now the time to be increasing penal, uh, prison sentences? Absolutely. This is so horrific. Uh, let somebody out that's a drunk driver. I mean, this, this is a situation where you can't continue to allow a situation in our own backyard. We're using Metro as an example. We're using MetroLink. We've got brochures out because they're using the public transportation system uh, to move these young yeah. ladies. And so you just, you know, you can't just right. throw these girls out and slap them on the hand and they're back at their pimps. I've known you for a while and I could see the depth of your emotion in your face when you said that. So I thank you for your passion. His name is Don Kanabi, member of the Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles County. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brian Pomerantz. Our guest, Gary DeLong, member of the Long Beach City Council, candidate for the U.S. Congress. And you've been on the Long Beach City Council for six years, yeah. but the congressional seat is larger than Long Beach. In fact, about 40% of it is in Orange County. So these are new voters to you, they are. new friends to you. Talk to me about campaigning on the other side of the curtain. Well, actually, I very much enjoyed it. You're exactly right. It's 42% Orange County, 58% Los Angeles County. Had an opportunity to meet new friends, expand my network. I I've enjoyed it very much. And really dig deep and give me a sense. Is it that different oh, between yeah. L.A. County? Oh, yes. It really? Oh, it is. It is. Tell me. It is. I mean, th there is the orange curtain. There is. Absolutely. So what is it? Be, well, be specific. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh -huh. uh, to our, I, I, as you know, I'm a Republican, registered yes. Republican, yes. and the Long Beach City Council, there's one Republican, me. That would be you. Eight Democrats, right. Democrat mayor, but which yes. is good because it's, it's taught me it's to build yeah. consensus, collaborate. Well, now I go into Orange County and, you know, 90% of the elected officials right. are Republicans. It's, it, it's strange being a majority. Although in that portion of the district, it isn't overwhelmingly Republican. It's not as if 58% of the district is all Democratic because it's in L.A. County and 42% is all Republican because it's in Orange County. It, it, it's overwhelmingly Repu Republican, but it's not overwhelmingly conservative Republican. Well, that's it, it's more moderate Republican. And so how does that play? Well, it, it, it plays well once you get used to it. I'd say another unique thing is the Vietnamese community. The right. Vietnamese community is very strong in Orange County. So I, I have, it's a fascinating Although culture. Although what's interesting is I uh, was recently uh, interviewing a professor from UC Riverside, uh, Karthik Ramakrishnan, and he was the lead author of the National Asian American Survey. Mm -hmm. And what he said is that Vietnamese Americans who had been monolithic for Republicans aren't so monolithic anymore, especially in the younger generations. That's absolutely true. So that presents a challenge for Republicans who presume that, oh, Vietnamese, they're all for me. Well, well first of all, let me just assume that nobody's all for me. <laughs> that, that's mistake well number stated. one. When you presume that somebody's in but your you camp. you know what I'm getting at. But, but you're right. But you're right. The, the, the older uh, Vietnamese that have been in the country right. for quite some time, they tend to, to go Republican. And the younger, not so much. Right. The other interesting uh, part of that district, and also the L.A. County side, is there's a large Latino community. There is. And I think it's fair to say that the top of the Republican ticket has had difficulties uh, attracting Latino voters. I mean, as we speak today, you know, it's two to one, three to one, uh, the, the upside down for the top of the GOP ticket. How does that play for you? Well, when you look at the voter registration, though, what's interesting is the Vietnamese actually vote above in the voter registration. Latinos vote that below the registration. That is actually true. So it, it does balance out over time. But that being said, you want to be a representative for all. Absolutely. And so, and you know, Cambodian community in Long Beach. Sure. Is, is and very and so, what do you do to try to break through those traditional um, concerns that may or may sure. not be valid? But oh, they're not valid. Right. For example, in the Vietnamese culture, human rights is a, is a huge issue for them. And what's going on in, in Vietnam, and the fact mm -hmm. that it's not a free country, and the fact that that people are in prison for their political views. It's a tremendously right. large What about on the family. Latino side? Because look, you know, yes, they do vote in smaller proportion to their population registration, but I mean, let's face it, the Latino community is growing. Yeah, absolutely, and, and will continue and, to. Yeah, and demographically, it's important for all elected officials to be able to connect. You do. And so how do you work to connect to the Latino community who, as we speak today, is a bit suspect of the top of the Republican ticket? Well, I think the first thing that you need to do, and one of the things that I've done in the campaign, is that I'm not running on a ticket. I mean, yes, I'm a registered Republican, mm -hmm. but I, I don't run with a party platform. So I'm going to connect, going to connect with you as an individual, not as a representative of a group. And people really respond and relate well to that. So let's talk about the connections you hope to make uh, if you should join the Congress in January. Which is uh, looking good so far, but well, we still wish you the best of luck. We wish you the best of luck. I do want to talk about what we know as uh, the regulatory environment, mm -hmm. uh, not only in our state but in our nation. We know that California has consistently been ranked pretty low as it relates to a regulatory environment. Yes. Yes. I mean, Forbes has. You know, hammered California but you're looking at the national side and so I want to get a sense what can Congress do nationally 50 states over 300 million people God knows how many businesses how do you affect regulation on the national front well I, I think you have to do a, a couple of things and I was recently meeting with the Chamber of Commerce group and kind of listening to what their concerns mm -hmm. were but first of all, I have to go back to kind of what Governor Duke Majin did in California a number of years ago where, where he put this panel together and he looked at 50,000 state regulations. And some were, were perfect and they left them alone. Right. Others need to be tweaked. Some just had to be thrown out. But how much? You have to do it at the federal level. Yeah. you got to look at it and say, why are we driving our jobs 
offshore. And I'll give you a perfect example. When AT&T and T-Mobile were looking at a merger and the FCC said, well, as part of the deal, we want you to bring some of those call centers back mm -hmm. in the States. I think that was the wrong question. We should have said, what is it that we need to change from a policy perspective so that you would want to bring those jobs back in the state? Because if I can get you to bring them back, right. then Microsoft and Dell. And but, but here's what's interesting. They're going to follow. You know, we look at what's happening in Asia, and we can talk from here to eternity about human rights in China or Thailand or whatever it may be, but we just cannot compete with their labor costs. I mean, but it's not just labor costs. Like I don't know if you read the book Thomas Friedman that used to be us, but one of the, the examples he gives is is in a very short period of time, they built a state-of-the-art, two million square foot convention center, and over that same period of time in Washington, they couldn't get the escalator on the metro working. I, I, I you know, hear it's, you. It's like eight months. I mean, no, that, and, and I, that's not just I labor costs. But let's, you know, it's, let's, it's a bureaucracy, it's but, the rules, but, it's the regulations, it's so difficult But today. look what happens when they have earthquakes. I mean, mm -hmm. the number of people killed in China in the earthquake. And the pollution, and, and you know, the, yeah, a lot of things that, that right, we so, want to do right. but. Right. You want to keep those attributes that we have, but you got to get rid of some of these burdens and regulations. It's it's killing but us. Is it? And, and uh, uh, forgive me, I'm learning because you sure. know I feel real up on state regulation and those issues. But how much regulation really is there on the federal level? I've always thought of regulation as more of a state issue. If you look at, I want to say minute, but administrative regulations certainly they're at state level. But if you look at an EPA, for example, yes, certainly they're true. making federal regulations. Now California likes to go further. Than <laughs> we know EPA that. Says. Yes, that's we've right. heard about that. AB 32. Yes, indeed, right. that's one example. There, there are many. Right. Uh, but but there's a lot of regula regulations that happen on, on a federal level that we need to look at all those things and see is the bang worth the buck? Is the benefit worth the cost of the economy? And I will tell you, in 2012, with our economy on our needs, we need to revisit some of those decisions we've made. Is our economy on our needs? Absolutely. Because I, I do want to really dig into that issue. Um, look, there is no doubt that it is not 1997 when everything was humming sure. along, or even 2003 when yes. everything it's was humming booming. along. It's not booming. We'll agree on that. Yeah. But I really do feel as if it's a lot better than 2009. 2010. Ask that college student that graduated four years ago and still can't find a job can measure it with his or her abilities or skill I, and I, education. I, I mean, it, it's tremendously high. The, the opportunities you know, aren't there today. I guess why I push you is, you know, so much of reality is perception. And well, if you can't get a job, I will say that's not perception. Well, but look, <laughs> the jobless rate is down. Vis-a-vis, -vis, not 2006. But vis-a-vis -vis 2000... 78.8 percent, 8 percent, maybe over 40 months, that's pretty high. I, California's I, over 10. I, I, I we have an unemployment no, problem. No, I hear you. Again, I hear you. But, you know, look, you're, look, I know you, you're a reasonable guy, and I just wonder if, I, I'm not suggesting you're Jimmy Carter, but, you know, this whole malaise, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's the malaise speech. You know what? It's the you. malaise speech. It's just like, it's that dreadful, everything is terrible. Sure. And, and are we well served by, is that by saying everything is terrible when objectively it's not great, but it's not 2010. All right, well, let me make it clear. I'm not Jimmy Carter. I know, <laughs> and, I, and I said that, but you know but, what I'm getting. I do the know metaphor what you're getting is and, not perfect. And, and, and I think you know that I am a person that's optimistic. The glass is half full, and that, right. that's, that's the way I run my life, my business, mm -hmm. and my, my public sector. It's clearly who I am as an individual. But on the other hand, if you're not willing to recognize you have a problem, you're not going to be able to fix it. True. So let's not be Pollyannish saying, hey, and the I unemployment be. round is down 0.2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 we're on the way. But yet when I talk to people out in the business community, they tell me how lackluster mm -hmm. the economy is. Their revenues aren't growing. They're not hiring people. There's too much uncertainty, even if they had the money. And a lot of companies are sitting on cash these days. Uh, which is so frustrating. It's frustrating, but there's so much uncertainty out there. Is now a good time to invest and grow your business? Maybe, maybe not. If you're victorious and you get to Washington when, in January. When, not if. And the speaker, whoever he or she may be, says, what committee do you want to be? I now, that's Pollyannish. Yeah, that's Pollyannish. <laughs> but I'm, I'm neutral. And, and, and diluted, some diluted, might say. But clearly. No, no. What committee do you want to be on? If you could pick your committee, what would yeah, you well, be? I want to be on a couple of committees. First of all, I want pick to be on. Pick one. Uh, pick two. From, okay, pick tra two. transportation and budget. Perfect. Transportation okay. for my constituents, budget, because I'm just fascinated to go in and fix what's wrong. His name is Gary DeLong. He is a member of the Long Beach City Council, candidate for U.S. Congress on Pride Palmer. Thanks for watching California Edition.